Welcome back to Grab Bag. For some of you, it has been a week. For me, it's only been about a half hour. Uh, I know you don't memorize what I wear, but if you think about last week, I, I'm wearing the same shirt because I just simply took a quick break and am going to record this grab bag session while it's still sunny out and a little warm out here. This is series two, episode six. And if you want to put things on pause, uh, go get your Bible. If you don't have your Bible with you, we're going to be looking in the book of Genesis, obviously the Old Testament, and it would be helpful if you had your Bible because we're going to do a narrative that is quite extensive in, in that it covers uh, a number of chapters. And we, I don't want to extend these videos by reading such lengthy uh passages. So you can grab your Bible and uh, you can follow along with me when I do read a portion. But also, um, you, you, if you want to put it on pause and, and read, let's say Genesis chapter 27. Yes, Genesis chapter 27 at this point. Um, I think that would be helpful. And then uh, Maybe turn it back on and we can continue from there. Make sure that you sign in. If you're able to do so, we'd appreciate having that information, okay? So um, I've got not much time here and you're, you're probably happy to hear that <laughs> because my computer is running down. This is the second grab bag I recorded today. And I've only got about another hour, an hour and a half until uh, my beautiful wifey comes home, and uh, I think we have planned that we're going to go take a walk in the park. Yeah, it's a nice day for that. It's a metaphor for living with joy. It's a walk in the park. <laughs> if you ask her if it was that way of living with me, she'd probably say, no, mine's a, a, a hard uphill battle up Mount Everest. Yeah, so I, I got the, the good side of things. But anyway, let me move on. My first five lessons uh, in series two of Grab Bag have been more topical in nature. Uh, last week, which was just about an hour or so ago, I recorded uh, the Grab Bag on Unity. And so I decided I wanted to go back and do something directly from the scripture, not that the topics don't have scripture reflected in them, but we're going to look back in a narrative of Jacob as found in the Old Testament book of Genesis. Um, Jacob is a guy who came on the scene just a few years prior to my birth. That was a joke. Um, he's one of the sons of Isaac, a grandson of Abraham, uh, not the Lincoln variety of Abraham, but you know, Abraham, the patriarch. So a pre-note. There are many reasons to love and appreciate the Bible, but one of the minor reasons is its truthfulness. Now, I mean, it tells the truth, but I mean truthfulness in the sense that it's honest. It just lays the faults and the good points of its characters right out there. When you get to feeling like you're not measuring up to God's standards and Satan uses those thoughts to send self-condemnation your way, all you need to do is just open your Bible and read about the weaknesses of the members of the Faith Hall of Fame. In Jacob, we see strengths, but we also see glaring flaws. But through both, we witness the grace and the power of Almighty God. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Roman Christians, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Well, you kind of wonder if all those Bible heroes would appreciate people millennium of years, millenniums of years later being able to see them in all of their faulted glory as well as in their successes. But these were written 
and, re and preserved for us in order to teach us, to encourage us in our faith, and to provide hope. It's the honesty of the scripture that adds to its validity. No one, even the gospel writers writing about themselves, whitewashed their stories or tried to practice what today we call redaction to elevate their character. Discovering that God forgives mistakes and uses weaknesses to his glory provides confidence for us in our walk of faith. As Paul stated, what was written in the past was written to teach us endurance, to encourage us as we walk our histories with the unchanging God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so I want to go back and follow the narrative of Jacob as recorded in Genesis. Jacob's life is intertwined with the life of his twin, Esau. I'm going to begin reading, actually, in Genesis chapter 25, in verse 19. And here I am going to read an extensive portion. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he, re when he married Rebekah, a daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Paran Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Now Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. And the Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, there are two nations in your womb. Not just two uh, sons, <clears throat> sorry, not just, you know, two embryos, but two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Now, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in the womb, and the first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. That is a sad statement. And the truth of it will wreak some real damage in their family. That father Isaac loves Esau. Rebecca, mom, loves Jacob. Well, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished, and he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, well, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an earth to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, stew and he ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. What's a birthright? Well, according to a birthright, um, the firstborn son became the priest of the family. Secondly, it was allotted to him a double portion of the paternal inheritance. Thirdly, the firstborn inherited judicial authority, the authority of his father, whatever it might be. And fourthly, the Jews attached a sacred importance to the rank of firstborn and first begotten. So the firstborn would receive 
quote, the blessing, which placed him in a more intimate and favored relationship with Yahweh God. And in my estimation, that's the most important aspect of a birthright, that the firstborn will receive the blessing from the Father, which places him in a more intimate and favored relationship with Yahweh. Now, the birthright was transferable, as we see. You know, um, Jacob connived and tricked his brother, or, or did he? Or was his brother just a fool to trade his birthright for a momentary satisfaction? Hmm. But anyway, the birthright became transferable. Jacob had Esau swear to turning it over to him. And maybe the fact that Esau sold it so willingly for physical satisfaction could prove that Jacob was actually wiser of the twins and was the best steward ultimately of the birthright. As his namesake indicates, Jacob was a conniver. He was a supplanter, which by definition is someone who purposely takes over a position of someone else. A few decades ago, in my first located ministry, a person was hired I'm trying to shrink this story down. Anyway, a person was hired on staff without my being the lead minister. Um, you know, they did it even though I really didn't think it was the best move. That right there set up some contention because it turns out one of the elders who I was really good friends with, we used to walk in the mornings, he said to me, he said, Rob, now, ironic, he said, this other guy is after your job. He knew it. He wanted to supplant me. And this other guy had been part of a denomination and been part of the political structure on top of the denomination. He knew how to play the games. And he was after my job. Long story short, it ended up, sadly, that he, he got my job. And so he was a supplanter. You know, he was someone who purposely takes over the position of someone else. Jacob's name literally meant grasps the heel. And figuratively, it meant he deceives. And it's interesting how that became actually a character trait. Whose fault was it that Eli lost his birthright? Was it Jacob for taking advantage of a situation? Or was it Esau's for undervaluing his birthright in the first place and making it no more of no more worth than a bowl of porridge? Look at Genesis 26, um, I'll read verses 34 and 35, because uh, we're going to keep rolling on here. This is a rather extensive, in fact, it, I've already done some work on the future uh, grab bags and this is the first of a three-part series so we can't we can't dawdle so to speak but in verse 34 and 35 at the end of chapter 26 we read when esau was 40 years old he married judith daughter of biri the hittite and also basimoth daughter of elon the hittite they were a source of grief to isaac and rebecca and i just point that out to you because that's going to come into play um, in the future. So Esau sells his birthright. He marries women outside of the race or the faith. And perhaps he really wasn't the best recipient for the birthright, really, because he was willing to step outside the faith and to marry. So Maybe he wasn't the rest, best recipient for carrying on the line of Abraham or the line of faith. You know, 
one of the things we don't have time to unpack this either, I think that's indicated in the book of Genesis is this carrying on of the line of faith. There, there has been, there always will be, as I said in the last lesson, you know, there's basically two types of people in God's economy. There are those who believe in God and trust God, and there are those who trust themselves and do not believe in God or seek God or trust God. And our purpose, of course, is to cross over the line, not to stay there, but to reach out with faith and to encourage people to come back to God, to come back into his family so that we can all be one in Christ. And you see this line developing very early in the book, or this, in, well, let's just say line, developing very early in the book of Genesis. Because you have Adam and Eve, and of course they have um, two sons, Cain and Abel, and Abel kills his brother Cain. Now this is what's interesting in chapter 4 at the very end, beginning verse 25, Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, listen to what she said, God has granted me another child in the place of Abel, since Cain killed him. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. This is an establishment of the line of faith. Abel was the brother who sought to honor God. Cain, you know, he walked out, the Bible says, he walked out of the presence of God. And so Cain kills Abel, and Cain is left of those people who live apart from God. And Eve has another son, and she says, God has given me Seth in the place of Abel. Seth becomes a continuance of the line of faith. And um, Seth is part of the, let me get back here. Seth is part of the lineage of David and thus the lineage of Jesus. So that's the line of faith. And when you look at Esau giving his birthright up so quickly and so easily and allowing it to be, I, I hope this is an okay turn. But term, but allowing it to be polluted by marrying outside of the Jewish race and Jewish faith, and maybe Esau wasn't the best person, and Jacob was. Not that Jacob had this whole idea that I'm going to keep things, you know, in house with grandfather Abraham and father Isaac and carry on the line, we're going to find out that actually it's as a result of this deception that he ends up going off and marrying someone within the family line. So uh, God has a way of working, but Jacob becomes the one who carries on the line of faith. So um, what lesson do you learn? Well, Perhaps a lesson about not undervaluing the gifts and the abilities that God has given you. you that phrase used to be, use them or lose them. You know? Don't undervalue the abilities, the talents, the gifts that God has built into you. Use them for him. Don't undervalue the people around you. Value your heritage and value where God has placed you. Another lesson, don't get caught up in physical temptations like Esau did. I mean, here's a guy who gave up his spiritual birthright just for the sake of some filling up his belly, some physical satisfaction. And another lesson, physical strength and power don't always rule the day or the world. You know, Esau was a stronger. How, how many times have you know, people, that old joke about, yeah, okay, well, you know, you got muscle, you got might, I got brains, and one day you'll work for me. 
you know, um, muscle does not always um, equate to leadership and to control of things. And so um, use what God has given you and use it for the best of your ability. It may be something physical, but then again, it may be uh, your ability to think and um, the ability to work people together, to grow a business. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so that's the first incident that I wanted to point out in the life of Jacob. The second incident is found in Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 40. And we don't have time for me to read 40 verses and then to keep talking at you as well in a lesson. So let's kind of move on. And here's what Jacob barters, as we know, for his brother's birthright, and he gets it. And so it would seem that overall, life just kind of went on okay in the Isaac tent hold. You know, do you see what I did there? Like not household, but tent hold, yeah. Um, so the birthright was Esau's to sell or give away if he so chose, or perhaps he felt that somehow the incident would be forgotten over time, you know, and that Jacob would forget that he had received a vow from Esau. Or maybe even when dad dies, I'll exert my power. I'll exert my rights. And it will not matter that I made a vow. And I'll get my birthright back. But the next incident we look at is over the top. Because it involves outright deception conceived and aided well, conceived and aided by mommy dearest for her favorite son, Jacob. So things are kind of, it seems rolling along okay. And then it comes time for what we call the blessing. And favoritism begins to do its damage. Favoritism has been infiltrating the family we already read. Dad loved Esau, mom loved Jacob, and now we're going to see the dastardly fruit of that sin. I mentioned the blessing earlier, and here's a little, a very quick summation that each father, prior to his death, would confer a blessing. And... Uh, it was particularly on the firstborn, but not always. A blessing that seems to have given the blessed one a higher spiritual standing with God and recognition as God's chosen leader in the family. And when we look at it, all of this deception, it seems as though God is in agreement with this arrangement Unlike the birthright, the blessing once given could not be revoked or transferred. So once the blessing is given, it's given. There's no passing it on to somebody else like Esau did with his birthright. And there's no evoking it, taking it back. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. But I'm not stopping. Well, Jacob now owns the birthright. We know that. But for mom and her goal for her favorite son, owning the birthright is not enough. Jacob has to get the blessing. And so she hatches a plan and convinces her son to deceive old blind Jake, you know, Jacob, and deceive him into conferring the blessing on Jacob. The supplanter, it, oh, great. Now I got a bug in my head. The supplanter is at work once again. Isaac is up in years, and he's running, it seems, only on one cylinder. His eyes are dimming, and even though his ears tell him that the boy speaking to him in this narrative in chapter 27, the boy speaking and awaiting the blessing before him is really Jacob, his nose in his hands tell him 
that it's Esau. And when you read the narrative, you'll understand what I'm saying. Okay? So he's ready to give his blessing. And instead of Esau, Jacob comes in. So his ears are telling him, you, you sound like Jacob. But his nose is telling him, um, and his hands, because of some deception, they're telling him that, no, this is my oldest son. This is the one that I love. This is the one who's going to get my blessing. It, it would seem that Isaac's taste buds had also taken a vacation, vacation because his instructions were that a meal be prepared for him for wild game, but what from wild game, but what he got was a goat dish instead that was prepared by Rebecca and served by Jacob. Well, the mother son deception works, and Jacob is given his brother's blessing to add to his stolen birthright. While Esau was out being manly, hunting meat for the meal, I mean, it, you know, of course, back then it wasn't like you just went down for some beef at Giant Eagle. Uh, both Isaac and Esau realized that they had had the goat pulled over their eyes. You know, Esau's out hunting. Jacob brings in the meal. He gets the blessing. And then Esau comes back, and they both realize that they had had the wool, or I said the goat, <laughs> I thought it was cute, the wool pulled over their eyes. They were deceived. The Bible says that Esau screams in response. And I think the worst words he could have heard were the words from his father, I have made him Lord over you and made all of his relatives his servants. Now, remember what we read back at the beginning, that God had said to Rebekah that the younger will serve the older. And so now we see even it's happening, even though it happens through deception. And so Esau... Genesis 27, 41 states, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. I mean, you know, he, they could sense Isaac was not long for this world. He said, then I will kill my brother Jacob. This is Cain and Abel all over again. Now, th things in the Jacob tent hold were not so peaceful. Uh, the birthright was one thing, but the blessing, becoming subservient to his younger brother, losing his birthright, not, or his blessing, not by his own choice like he did the birthright, but losing his blessing through deception. Mm -mm -mm. So, uh, Mommy decides that her favorite boy has to escape with his life. And now her sin will cause her to lose the very person she prizes most. Because Jacob's going to have to leave. And she's going to have to live with two men. I mean, there were other members of the family, but she's going to have to live with Esau and Jacob. Probably in a way that they would be social distancing, so to speak if not emotionally distanced. So once again, mom lies to her husband and uses Esau's wives, her daughter-in-laws. We read that earlier, that he had gone off and married two Hittite women. Well, here's where it comes into play, why I read it. Because now Rebecca is going to go to Isaac, and she's going to use those two daughters-in-law as the motivation for her decision to send Jacob away. She's sending him away because she fears for his life. But she says, I can't stand these pagan wives. If Jacob takes a wife from those no good Hittites, then my life is going to be worthless. It's kind of a paraphrase. 
That's a thing. Oh, 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 the drama for a dying man to bear. And so Isaac calls for Jacob and sends him away to the homeland, you know, to find a suitable wife from his mother's side of the family. And this homeland, by the way, is called Padan Aram. And I mention that simply to make known that Aram is the root of the word Aramaic, a dialect which Jesus and many Jews spoke. It was the native tongue, so to speak. You know, uh, <laughs> it was their own insider dialect. It was kind of, it'd be kind of like, I don't, I don't know, going to Lancaster, Lancaster? And here the Amish, they speak English, but they also speak Dutch. You know, their form of Dutch. So they got this insider language. Well, that's what Aramaic was like. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Before we look at the next section involving Jacob's dream ladder, I want to point out chapter 27, verse 20. Isaac asked his son. Now, Isaac has come in. He, he sent Esau off to get wild game, to kill wild game and make a meal for him. And in the interim, Jacob shows up, like I said, with his goat meal that his mother had prepared. And so Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly, my son? And this is Jacob's reply. The Lord, your God, gave me success. When Isaac asks, scheming Jacob, how he was able to hunt down food and prepare it so quickly, thinking it's Esau, remember that, but Esau's out hunting, and Jacob's response was um, something that I believe is very telling about his relationship with God, because Jacob replies, the Lord, your God, gave me success. Do you think it was a slip of the tongue? that Jacob said, the Lord, your God, and not my God or our God. Well, maybe, but I have to admit that I, I don't think that's true. I think that was a purposeful statement. And I'll explain as we go along, because this is going to be like a thread that plays through the entire Jacob narrative. So a second interesting plot is added to the story in chapter 28, verses 6 through 9. 28, verses 6 through 9. Now Esau learned that Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him to Padan Aram to take a wife from there. And then when he blessed him, he commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone. Esau then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac. So he went to Ishmael and married Mahalat, the sister of Nebaioth, and daughter of Ishmael, son of Abraham, in addition to the wives he already had. This is another interesting addition to the plot. Because Esau learned, after, after hearing that Jacob has taken off, has been given a blessing and taken off to go find a woman from uh, the family line, you know, it dawns on Esau just exactly how much his parents despise the Hittite wives that he has and the non, let's say, non-Jewish wives that he has. And so he goes and uh, marries some descendants of Ishmael and married the daughter of Ishmael, his father's despised and exiled half-brother. So you, you got to know a little bit about the history. Remember Abraham, God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, and that was going to be Isaac. And Sarah, Abraham's wife, who was already like in her 90s, started laughing about it. And she decided to help the thing along by saying to Abraham, well, you go ahead and you're going to have sex with one of my concubines. And so he has sex with Hagar, 
she gives him a son named Ishmael. And then eventually Sarah does have a son named Isaac. She names him Isaac. So she agrees for Hagar to go ahead and provide a son for Abraham. But after she has a son, she gets resentful and angry and hates uh, Hagar and Ishmael and has Abraham banish them from their tribe. And so there are two lines again, you see. The line of faith, which is Isaac, and the line of unfaith, if we put it that way, which is Ishmael. And so Esau sees how marrying outside of the Abrahamic line, well, you know, the direct line angers his family. And so in spite, he goes and marries other women who are not approved, so to speak, by uh, mom and dad. So, because uh, mom and dad don't want Jake the snake to marry women like that. So he marries the daughter of Ishmael, his father's despised and exiled half-brother. And it's like he's saying, take that, mom and dad. That's in your face. And you may recall that Ishmael, like I said, was the firstborn son of Abraham who was kicked out. So we're going to stop there and ask, what lessons can we learn? Uh, I want to give a few quick lessons as we shut down for now. But we won't have time to amplify these. Favoritism in families damages family bonds and has potential to even be destructive of life. Favoritism is a nasty, nasty sin. And I tell you what, I, we, we can't, like I said, we can't amplify this, but if your children, even though you may not feel that there's favoritism, if your children in some way indicate that they feel that there is favoritism in your family, even if they joke about it, boy, you should talk about it and try to do what you can to alleviate that. Because when it comes to favoritism, perception is reality. And if your children perceive that it's happening, even though it's not, you need to get to the root of it get it out and do what's necessary uh, to get things back in balance. But we don't have time to develop that. Esau had vowed to kill his brother after dad died. He didn't care, I guess, how his mom would feel. You know, what do I care? You know, I'm dad's boy. If I kill Jacob, who cares how mom feels? And so the sides had been decided as the boys grew up. Esau was 40 years old, 40 years old, when he married the Hittite women, his mom and probably his dad despised. So imagine the cold shoulders, the haughty, hateful, hurting words that were spoken, the resentment that had been building and building, all because of favoritism. Favoritism and deception were part of the Isaac family DNA all the way back to Abraham. And where favoritism rears its head, damage occurs. Being a godly family can help minimize the damage if each person is committed to finding an identity in Christ. But it will not keep the disease from negatively infecting relationships. Like I said, Esau is over 40 years old, and he still acts out his anger and family resentment by purposely marrying women that will rankle his parents. Perhaps it is the most lasting visible revenge he can invoke apart from killing his brother. But now his brother isn't there. And so he acts out his anger in this way. A second lesson, it may be that favoritism keeps Jacob from a relationship with God. Remember, I, I read you know, from the scripture that Jacob says, the Lord, your God, when he's speaking to Isaac, not my God, 
not our God. And it may be that favoritism was what kept Jacob from a relationship with God. He may have harbored his own anger toward this supposed man of God. Psychologists have said that many children's initial views of God result from their identity with or not with their relationships or identity with their fathers. Perhaps that's what we are witnessing here. I don't know. Are we just reading between the lines? I don't know. A third lesson. God is not deterred from his purpose by the sin and the intrigues of men. The truth is that Jacob will become the leader in the line of David that leads to the Messiah. But we're also going to find later on that God does not toss Esau away. Remember the promise was that two nations will come from you. And so God keeps that promise even for Esau. Of course, for God, it wasn't a promise. He already saw it. He knew it, right? But he keeps that promise that was made to Rebekah, that there were two nations. And so even though Jacob ends up being the one through whom the line of faith gets traced, God doesn't discard Esau. Uh, he's still going to do some amazing things with, in, and through Esau. God is faithful. And the final fourth lesson is this, that this narrative of sibling rivalry that began with Cain and Abel and is illustrated with Esau and Jacob is often seen as the headwaters of the Arab Israeli conflict that continues today. How, you know, how does this work itself out today? Well, there you go. If you think in terms of the Palestinian Arabs who feel they have been supplanted by the Jews during the Six Days War, the Islamic Jewish hatred is long inbred back to Ishmael and Isaac and back to Esau and Jacob. God kept his promise to Hagar that he would make a great nation of Ishmael. And he kept his promise to Rebekah that he would do the same. And yet today, his descendants continue to spread animosity, fighting like the despised black sheep of the children of Abraham. This Arab-Israeli conflict goes way, way back. And we see the headwaters of it right here in uh, this real, I was going to say this relationship, but let's say this uh, hurtful, difficult, dysfunctional relationship between Jacob and Esau. Well, that's it for now. Now, we're, we're not going to leave Jacob there running away. Next week, since I've already kind of written up next week's lesson, we're going to talk about the incident of Jacob's ladder and what happens there. And then uh, we're going to leave a, a large gap. And we're going to, two weeks from this time, we're going to look at uh, Jacob's return is coming back home and what that looks like, okay? Jacob is a very large part of the book of Genesis. And so it's not anything you can treat in, in just one lesson. In fact, three lessons is really not enough, but that's what we're going to settle for. So uh, here we are. We have the foundation, right? We see the struggle and uh, we can see the flaws we can see the strengths, and what we're wanting to do is to con watch God continually working through all of, the, all of these situations, through all of those character traits, and we're getting hope. Because if God can do that with people like that, hey, God can teach me, and God can grow me, and God can bring me hope.
So enjoy this next week. Go ahead and get your Bibles out and begin reading this narrative in Genesis chapter 25 and read all the way through the homecoming of uh, Jacob and the reconciliation of Jacob and Esau. Uh-oh. Spoiler alert. I just told you the ending. But we'll get to that. Okay? Take care.